From the American border to Gaza, from abortion fights to arguments over electrification, the partisan disputes are many. Republican John James and Democrat Debbie Dingell are here to tackle them all. And five years after ditching no-fault auto insurance, those stuck in the gap are still stuck. Today is Sunday, April 7, 2024, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. I'm so glad you're with us this morning. We've been trying to put together today's program for some time, and finally the stars have aligned for it to happen. Maybe it took a solar eclipse. Whatever it was, I'm grateful to have two members of the Michigan congressional delegation here to sit down together. It is, of course, a bitter election year, and the 118th Congress is on track to be one of the least productive in American history. Now, sure, some of that is due to the fact that neither side is particularly invested in the other side's success in an election year, but that's been true during many election cycles before. We are currently sharply divided over so many matters, many of them of critical importance and time timeliness. We'll see how much common ground we can find today as I'm joined by Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Dingell and Republican Congressman John James. And then a little later on, as I've said on this program before, when we got no-fault insurance reform several years ago, I don't think Michiganders believed coverage was being stripped away from those already receiving it. Well, since then, there's been more sympathy than action for those caught in the gap. We'll talk about that and more today on Flashpoint. Well, if it feels like your daily rundown of headlines right now is a tangled mass of turmoil, you are not alone, nor are you wrong. Hot spots, foreign and domestic, are many, and that is why I'm so glad to have two members of the Michigan congressional delegation to talk about them today. I've been wanting to put this conversation together for a while, and today we've got Democrat Debbie Dingell representing Michigan's 6th District and Republican John James from Michigan's 10th District. Thank you both so much for Absolutely. being here. Congressman, let me start with you. Sure. I, I'd like us to start with what's going on in, uh, with Israel and the Hamas war. Uh, we had this horrific, horrific tragedy this past week. Seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen killed in a strike that Israel is saying now was a mistake. But is your support for Israel, and in particular the leadership of Benjamin Netanyahu, is it waning at all yet? Unwavering support for Israel. Um, but one thing that we have to make abundantly clear, we all have to remember that Hamas started this war. Hamas, we have to be very careful to remember, wants to eliminate Jews. Jews, Israel specifically, need, recognize the need to deal with and eliminate Hamas. The, the fact here is war is hell. I've been to war. I've been to combat. I understand the fog of war. Uh, nobody wants innocent civilians to die, but it is Hamas that killed innocent Israelis. And it is Hamas that is putting innocent Palestinians in harm's way. But uh, you, so you have uh, no sympathy for? Um, I didn't say uh, that. Wait a minute. No, I no, no, I, I, no, no. I, I don't want to say sympathy. You, do you not believe that President Biden should be asking for a ceasefire in exchange for the hostages? I believe that President Biden should enforce the sanctions that Congress has already passed for the funders of Hamas, the funders of Hezbollah, the funders of Houthis. I believe that President Biden has been soft on Iran, and it's led to destabilizing the entire region. I think that we have to get to the root causes of this, of, uh, of the weakness uh, of the alliance between, uh, between Israel and the United States. There must be no daylight between the two, while also driving accountability to eliminate uh, civilian casualties. Congressman Dingell, what are your thoughts so far? First of all, Israel's got a right to exist. What Hamas did was a terrorist act, and I want the hostages to come home. But we need a ceasefire. I, what we are watching now, we have seen 13,000, 14,000 children have died. Uh, I, everybody wants to debate the number. It's over 30,000 uh, innocent civilians that have died. Uh, we have a famine that is taking place. People have been displaced from their homes. 85% of the infrastructure has been destroyed in Gaza. We, and what I'm really worried about is some of the most recent actions, uh, besides what happened to the Central Kitchen relief workers, and I, I support those that want the independent investigation, is we could be, when you talk about Iran, we could be looking at a far more serious war mm -hmm. in the Mideast, mm -hmm. which will have devastating consequences for the world. That's right. You have watched in a number of primaries, including here in Michigan, 
the stacking up of votes that uh, people voting uncommitted, uh, trying to make their argument to President Biden that uh, the support for Israel is uh, not particularly popular right now among a lot of Democrats. Are you worried about his, uh, what should that calculation come into his, the way that he uh, reasons now and argues with, for policy? I don't think that politics should actually impact a decision about something of such serious world no. consequences, though I think that the president needs to be really looking at all sides of this. I think those are two, actually two very different issues. I've had very direct conversations with the president. John and I and my colleagues and I talk about this all the time. I want peace and I want peace in the Mideast. And it, it's far easier to say that than to say that. I think Michigan's very complicated. I think uncommitted got the attention of the president and how people feel. But I think there are a lot of other issues that are going to drive what happens in Michigan and doesn't happen in Michigan. And that is an issue that will drive the outcome. And I have so many issues that I want us to get together, let, let, let's, uh, to get to. Let's move to Ukraine. Uh, the, the fight right now over funding for Ukraine and border security, I think to a lot of people, those really shouldn't have a whole lot to do with each other. And yet here we are. It sounds like this coming week, uh, Congressman, there, it, we're going to see another run at putting these together. What's the right answer here? Uh, the right answer is to first secure our border and also to keep our promises to our allies. Uh, we have to do both. Um, and I believe that uh, from what I'm hearing, uh, being able to do both uh, is, is great for our country domestically and on the, uh, on the global stage. Well, I'm not sure we're going to do anything to secure our border in the bill that we may. We're hearing lots of rumors and nobody knows what the reality is. I am going to, we need to have comprehensive immigration reform. The closest we've come to it in decades this has been a problem for Republican presidents and Democratic mm -hmm. presidents mm -hmm. that had a bipartisan agreement in the Senate side. They were going to move it. And Donald Trump said, I don't want a border agreement because I don't want to give Joe Biden a win. I, that is not how you do politics. We need to work together. I'm committed. Uh, I know my colleague is committed. We need to do something to do that. We need to give aid to Ukraine. What I do think we are likely to be looking at next week is a Ukraine aid package, humanitarian aid, and I don't know what's going to be in there for Israel or Taiwan. Neither of us knows because there's so much negotiations and so much behind the door and so many threats. It's not the way you do foreign policy, and it's why America is not trusted abroad in many places. Can I respond to that real quick? Yeah, of course. It's the easiest thing in the world for my Democrat colleagues to blame everything on Donald Trump because it relieves them of the ability of, of actually having to solve the problem. The didn't fact, he, did, did the he fact, short the circuit fact that of last the package? The fact, the fact of the matter is Joe Biden has acted to make our border less secure 60 times since he's taken office. The fact of the matter is that uh, 12 times Bill Clinton acted to secure the border, 19 times Obama acted to secure the border. That's 31 times out of the 66 times in my lifetime since 1981. Look it up yourself. INA, Immigration Naturalization Act, uh, it was passed in 1952, 66 times in my lifetime to secure the border, and Joe Biden has done everything he could to ignore it. That's 9 million that's gotten over illegally. That's 110,000 people who've died of fentanyl overdoses. That's 1.6 billion people. When I visited the Del Rio sector, that we learned are going to the cartels each and every single year. And we just learned that over 500 of the over 500 people who are uh, on the terror watch list who've crossed over into this country, 84% are crossing on the northern border. That's right here in Michigan. The same power that Joe Biden had to repeal the Trump era like the Remain in Mexico policy. The same power they had to repeal it, he has that same exact power to put it back in place. We can't blame Donald Trump for the failures of Joe Biden, and Joe Biden has the power and the authority to do something about it now, and he's failing to do it because he doesn't want to do anything about it. Um, you just gave a thousand statistics which we could go in and dig into. I'm going to give you Facts. one fact. Yeah, go no, for it. No, I'm going to give you a fact. Go for it. Republicans and Democrats in the Senate reached an agreement for border security that would have done comprehensive immigration reform, which we haven't had in decades, and one person stopped it. Former President Donald Trump. Here's another stat. H.R. 2 passed last spring. That's the Secure the Border Act. You voted against it, and so did your Democrat colleagues, and it's been sitting in Chuck Schumer's desk and for a year. And so if you want to point the finger at one party, you better use your thumbs, too. Because I will. immigration, I you, immigration, I is, immigration is, an, is a moral and economic imperative for the United States of America. Both but ways. border security is national security. And we can't point our finger at Donald Trump to take the fact uh, off the table that Joe Biden has failed. 
Donald Trump didn't win and build his wall either. Got, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. I know there's one thing that you both agree on. We're going to start with that. Sounds but good. we've got a lot more to discuss. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Don't go away. Welcome back, Flashpoint. As I mentioned off the top of the program, the 118th Congress, uh, historians will tell you, has been among the least productive in American history. But one place where we are finding some unity among, especially uh, among the Michigan and I think all the Great Lakes states uh, leaders, is on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Can I talk a little bit quickly? I, I know you both agree, but what, what will this I mean, do? The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is a bill that has passed and been signed into law, which continues to clean up our Great Lakes. Well, I'm co-chair and it's a bipartisan task force that John is a member of and the Great Lakes are 20 percent of the fresh water in this country. I can remember swimming in, I just read an article this week, uh, it is 20 percent of the fresh water in the world, that the St. Clair River which I swam in when I was a kid was the, one of the dirtiest waters in the world mm -hmm. before it got cleaned up. We're going to continue to clean it up and we got to protect our waters, we got to protect it from being diverted and we're all in agreement. Yes, yeah, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative yields uh, 62 uh, billion in, uh, in economic activity and benefit, uh, and, and so it's, it's a massive benefit to uh, to the folks of Michigan. No brainer, uh, not just for personal enjoyment, but also for our, our economy. And uh, you mentioned something uh, that uh, I, I'm pretty excited about. That even though this Congress has looked to not be get get very much done, that as a freshman, I've gotten four bills passed through the House. And as a freshman, the first year, gotten four bills passed through uh, subcommittee just this year and gotten 118 million dollars back to my district as a freshman and now I'm uh, with my friend uh, Debbie Dingle on the Energy and Commerce Committee and we're doing everything that we can to look after things like health and manufacturing in Michigan. Let me move back to an area where I don't think you two find agreement. I'm curious as to how you feel Congressman about uh, well Donald Trump has is, is, is turned this into, a, into another campaign uh, issue over whether or not it should be the states deciding abortion policy or whether as he's promoting that we should see a 15-week national abortion ban. So I think the people of the state of Michigan already decided that no party, no person, no president would decide that for Michigan. And uh, Prop 3 passed uh, in, in 2022. Uh, and so despite the fear-mongering that you hear on the left, the fact of the matter is that abortion is enshrined in our Constitution. If you're a woman in this state, you can have an abortion. In fact, nationwide abortions have actually increased uh, since Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, there's nothing that can be done legislatively at the federal level, uh, and even if it could, it has no chance of passing uh, with 60 votes in the Senate and in uh, and, uh, and the House of Representatives. Well, people said that Roe versus Wade could never be turned over at the Supreme Court, and it is, and we did vote. But then we saw an Alabama Supreme Court try to ban in vitro, and as somebody who tried to get pregnant for a long time, I know the despair of parents who are wanting that. And former President Trump talks about a national abortion ban. I am a Catholic woman. It's an individual woman's decision to make. I would make a dis different decision. This country is founded on a separation of church and state. We have to keep that separation there. The government does not belong in a woman's decision to, on her own health care. And I wish that I had the sense of comfort that you did about what the government could do to a woman's health because I worked my lifetime trying to make progress for women and we go backwards almost every single year. Well, first of all, Congress, I want to say thank you for sharing that very personal story. Um, I think that's very important for a lot of people to hear. I support IVF and most of my colleagues do as well. And the focus uh, that we are now moving forward in Michigan are on things like pr protecting parental consent, advised consent, and making sure that your tax dollars aren't used for someone else's abortion. I, I want to make sure that we, since we are now headed toward an election that most Americans, the polls tell us, don't want, up to 70 to 80 percent of the voters don't want to see it be Joe Biden versus Donald Donald Trump, and yet that's where we seem to be. I want to ask you both about whether you have misgivings of your, about your party standard bearer. You've heard all of the complaints about, uh, about Joe Biden, the, especially when you consider how old he will be by the time he comes to the end of the next term. Do you have any concerns or, so, or, or misgivings about him being your Joe party's Biden, nominee? I've known Joe Biden for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I know this man is one of the most empathetic 
compassionate and does not get credit for all the things that he has delivered for, like getting lead out of every pipe, getting internet into every home, fixing our roads and bridges, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, protecting a woman's right to choose to, and trying to get us back so that the, the government is not in here. And by the way, the difference in age between Donald Trump and Joe Biden is not a lot. Joe Biden cares about people. He doesn't try to divide people. He tries to bring them together. And when President Trump comes into my state and calls any human being an animal, when I, I, he says if this is the last election... I want election, you to stay with Joe Biden because I'm going I'm to force yeah, him to I, stay with Donald I, I, Trump. So I'd rather you stay with Joe well, Biden. Well, let's just do me one thing. Don't tell me if he doesn't win that this will be the last election. I'm tired of people talking about bloodbaths. Let's bring us together. Let me let you tell me about your thoughts about Donald Trump, given that he's got more than 80 criminal indictments around him. 91. Uh, and, uh, I said more than 80. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and has also talked about um, pardoning the January 6th insurrectionist. Do you have any misgivings about Donald Trump being your party standard bearer? Look, if you break the law, you pay the price. Uh, that's, that, should be, that, that should be a no-brainer. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is where most people are, most people are worse off. I wasn't uh, sure if you were, when you say where you break the law, do you mean Donald Trump or the insurrection? I mean the, uh, the people who broke the law on January 6th, okay. right? And people who break the law uh, every day before and every day after. You break the law, you pay the consequences. That's, that's fair, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I also believe that where most people are right now, Joe Biden has caused an inflation crisis that's jacked up the price of energy uh, 30%. Uh, again, if, if, let's, stay, let's stay with Donald Trump. Okay. Though, All right, let's, and, okay and, well, how about this? How about this? You mentioned uh, the, the world and what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. We had relative peace in the Middle East back when Donald Trump was in office. That's a fact. We had relative peace in the Middle East. We were taking out terrorists who did bad things to Americans and our allies. We moved the embassy to, uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and we had the Abraham Accords. We had a more secure border, and Joe Biden came on day one and repealed the things like Remain in Mexico. And then you also had a president who helped boost our economy, and everybody um, uh, felt better, and they had the dollar moving farther. Inflation is out of control. Uh, the uh, the immigration is out of control, and international crisis is out of control. And people can look at both examples, and they are making their choice. And I, Donald Trump is leading in Michigan for that reason. I got to get to a break. I'm so grateful that you were both here. I know that there are a lot of we did find an area where you're both uh, in agreement. That's for sure. We work together for the people of Michigan. I of think course, that's 100%. important. To say. It is important to say. Thanks so much, both of you. And uh, we come right back. We'll talk about. The folks falling in the gap in Michigan's no-fault insurance reform. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. After years of complaints about Michiganders paying the highest car insurance rates in the country, Michigan turned aside the no-fault system in 2019. But what hath that wrought? I'm joined by frequent Flashpoint guest Chad Livengood, political editor and columnist for the Detroit News. Chad, you've been writing about this a lot. In particular, the, uh, the heartbreaking story of Annabelle Marsh, a uh, little girl who is one of these, I guess, I, I, I'm calling them the, the folks caught in the gap, um, who fi suddenly find themselves without the care that they were receiving. And as I've said many times, I'm not sure anybody thought that's what we were voting for, to take care away. Yeah, so when in 2019, when lawmakers tried to reform uh, the highest car insurance rates in the country, they put a lot of uh, cost controls into the system that did not exist. And it was a system, it was really a Wild West system, where basically a medical provider, hospital, doctor, pain doc, the pharmacy, the home health care company, they would charge whatever they could get the insurance company to pay. And sometimes the insurance company would pay their rates, they're usually the highest rates that they would charge. And sometimes the insurance company would send a check for half as much and they'd say, sue us yeah. uh, if, if you want to get that money. And then that what happened is like, I, I wrote about this at Crane's Detroit Business at the time. Um, Two thirds of the, of the lawsuits in 2018 in Oakland County Circuit Court were related to car insurance. Now, no fault by its own name was meant to be that no one is at fault, that we're going to pay the claims. We we're going to spend all this time in court. We're going to spend all this time in court, but the whole thing got gummed up. Of course, we also have just like a whole cottage industry of, of what I'll call billboard lawyers. We all know who they are, uh, and they, they work around this system to go and find, uh, I mean, they're the perverse ambulance chasers. So they, the law, legislature set out to try to f reform this, lower these costs, 
and they put these really stringent cost controls in that kicked in in 2021. And the, the big one was, I mean, it was a certain percentage, basically 200 to 250% of what Medicare pays. They, mm -hmm. they, they took any kind of like payment that a hospital would charge for fixing, a, setting a broken bone uh, or, or physical rehab or even just pain, pain medicine. And they, they, that's what the hospital could charge. But then when it comes to long-term care for people who become um, uh, catastrophically injured, they, they're, they're, they're paralyzed, they have a brain injury, a uh, spinal cord injury of some sort. Like Annabelle. Yeah, like Annabelle. And she's a six-year-old girl. She was injured when she was three years old in a snowstorm car accident on US 23 in Brighton. It right. could be any of us who drive that route. Of course. Uh, every day, and so um, what, what happened is that the the, the cost controls for long term care for home health care, they they put a uh, they put a um, a cut of forty five percent. And these, these home health care companies say simply the economics just don't work. That if you are going to be charging $30 an hour for home health care aid for this kind of intensive work, and then all of a sudden the, the, the auto insurance company only yeah. has to pay you $16 an hour, then you've got to pay someone within that $16 an hour. And, and the math just doesn't work out. And, you just, and this whole thing collided with... So these the, folks are going out of business and leaving a, a lot of folks without care. I, what is, we've been talking about this now and about these folks that are stuck in the middle what what it where are you, are you sensing because I certainly haven't had any luck finding real answers or you know uh, prescriptions for fixing this as I said nobody expected we were taking it away can we not find a way to give it back but I, I'm not seeing any answers coming out of the Capitol well in July the Michigan Supreme Court ruled that people were injured before 2000 June 2019 when the law went into effect they were entitled to the same level of care they had before that their contract uh, could not be um, uh, cut up essentially and so they got their care restored and their care companies got their payments restored but anyone injured after that uh, is subject to this law still and that's where folks like Annabelle are falling into yeah. the proverbial yeah. crack here where the legislature the, the Michigan Senate responded in October and passed a bill to increase rates that to, that, that, that the providers say they could live with that are more manageable that actually uh, won't result in losses the company that has Annabelle, they get, she, they, she came into their into their care just months before the cuts went into effect, and they have sustained 1.3 million dollars in losses. This is a girl that's on a ventilator. She requires 24-hour care. She's, yeah. She has no control use of her arms and hands. Right. She's quadriplegic, and this is this is really intense, intimate type work that that requires uh, pe yeah. really high-skilled people. And and it's a really but there's, she's not alone. There are three people a day who end up as catastrophically injured in this in this state. Yeah. And and you've had very little luck talking to Brenda Carter in uh, Lansing. I've invited her to be on the program, the head of the uh, of the insurance committee, and we, we both have had the same amount of luck. Chet, thank you very much for helping shed a little more light on this horrible problem. And that's it for us this morning. We're all out of time. Thanks so much for being here. Meet the press coming up next. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Flashpoint.